I don't have any changes to the agenda that we do have the uh, last minute, um, last minute. This morning, Natalie Banofsky sent the letter um, that the Workforce Development Board is uh, circulating about the, the HEROES Act. Uh, Mike, Lynn, I sent that to committee members, but didn't get to send it to all legislators. If somebody on the, somebody else could zap that to the full legislature, maybe, or maybe I can get that done while, while somebody else. I can do that. I can do that from my phone. Okay. Thank you, Deborah. I'm having okay. trouble just talking, much less multitasking. <laughs> um, well, Kathy, uh, Kathy or Katrina, I didn't see any public comment. Do you have anything? No. Okay. All right. Uh, Jason, are you on the call? Jason Molino. Okay. As as people just heard, I, I can't see phone only people on the call. So I just, that's why I asked. And we will always have a slot for Jason. Um, of course, if we are, since we're the first Wednesday, we always will follow a first Tuesday legislature meeting. So uh, need for an administrator's report might be less uh, urgent in this uh, committee. So as far as my report, um, I have, um, there's a, a chart that I got from, from NACO, the National Association of Counties, um, which is, is really, I'm finding an excellent resource. I'm, I'm glad that, um, that we've joined and we've kind of been, I've been in conversation with some other staff and, and they do have a lot of good resources on their uh, website. Um, so in your packet is um, a chart that, a brief description, 1800 page HEROES Act. Um, they boil it down to three pages and with a specifically a, um, a, a table that makes it really pretty easy to, to understand the differences between these two bills. Um, so I wondered uh, if folks have any comments on that. There's a lot, and Natalie's letter from the Workforce Development Board does talk about the HEROES Act. So this is uh, certainly relevant in terms of our, hi Natalie. Um, yeah. In terms of our advocacy, this is really the big kahuna. Um, what happens with federal uh, aid to local local governments and state governments? So, kind of what we do on this particular legislation, if anything, is 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 important. Um, so let me just open it up to conversation. I know Mike Sigler has something he wanted to say. I wonder if any, you know, whoever wants to weigh in on, on what you see here on the table and you might have yeah i mean i can i can certainly say some things on it i, I mean i don't have a real problem with the monies I, I mean i think more is better but the problem with any kind of bill is you're going to have all these little add-ons into the bill and you know i don't begrudge one side or the other from adding things in that they like that they can then either negotiate away or maybe they hope to kind of get them in I mean, into the final package. But I mean, I know some some pretty glaring examples in, in the HEROES Act that I, I actually don't support. I hope that they are negotiated away. Um, but, you know, I'm not the one negotiating. It. So I, I, I'm not going to I don't think we should really throw our weight in one way or the other um, uh, on, on a bill that has so many moving parts in it. I, um, I mean, I think a blanket statement of saying, listen, we need money or we're going to be kind of like what you've been doing, Martha, is, listen, if, if you don't help us out here, we're going to be, have to lay off firefighters and police and, uh, you know, public, uh, public health people. Um, and I think people understand that. And just because the one has more money than the other for that, I, I, that doesn't offset a lot of the problems that I see that are in heart in the HEROES Act that, like I said, I hope are uh, negotiated away. So, so that's so, kind of I don't where know if you I don't know if you saw my email back to you maybe 10 minutes ago. No, I didn't. I was hoping you could give us some specifics. What are the poison pill issues that you really oppose? Because for example, if those are things that we would be willing and happy even to negotiate away in return for the rest of the bill, that would be good perspective to have. 
Um, okay. I mean, I can certainly go and dig into it. I wasn't going to go dig into a thousand page of legislation, but I mean, I can. Um, but okay. Yeah, I'll do that. I mean, frankly, huh. I, I, I have more faith in the, um, the bipartisan bill that came out with Reed, even though it was less money, but I'll compare the two and I'll put something together. I mean, I just saw this letter from the workforce thing this morning and I haven't even seen your email yet. So let me work on that. All right. Let me, I'll get to Anna and Deborah in a second, but Mike, I will, I can send the 20, there's a 23 page summary from um, NACO about the HEROES Act. So I can send that. It's well organized. You can quickly zip through it. So I'll, okay. I'll do that after the meeting. Uh, so Deborah and then Anna. Yeah, um, I don't have a problem signing the letter. As a matter of strategy, I do think that going forward, there's not a lot of point in us throwing our weight behind the HEROES Act when it's been spelled out clearly to us by McConnell and Reed and NACO and NYSAC that the thing's DOA in the Senate. Um, in fact, on that NYSAC and NACO webinar, what they urged us to do is lobby for, you know, unrestricted aid paid directly to counties and municipalities. They cautioned us away, actually, from supporting a particular bill. Um, what I would say that we could do with this very well-drafted letter is perhaps say that what we were supporting was the allocation of funds for workforce development that's encompassed in the HEROES Act. That way we wouldn't necessarily be throwing all our weight behind an act that we know wasn't gonna be adopted. Reed said that it wasn't even gonna to go to conference. Um, and I think that's a function of the fact that it's 1800 pages long. Um, so that's my two cents and it's worth exactly what you pay for it. Um, listen, I this part of the meeting, I, I intended kind of to like dig into this table, which I think is, is a helpful resource, sort of deciding what, I mean, I think later in the meeting, we can really dig into the advocacy part and, and Natalie can, you know, and Natalie's letter, but I, my, so I, I didn't intend for this to be a debate about it. I, I did want to note a couple of specific things in the table that are notable to me. Um, so I'll get back to that after Anna. Go ahead, Anna. Uh, yeah, and I, I honestly, I think that saying that it's dead on arrival, it feels a bit like a game of chicken. Um, you know, whoever um, screams louder that, you know, their bill is the right bill, by the time negotiation starts, it sort of just sets the stage of um, who will be in a stronger negotiating position. So I don't, I, I hear, you know, what Deborah said, that makes, that makes sense. I certainly think that we should be clear and highlight specific strengths. Um, obviously, the total fund directly to counties, the splitting between municipalities and counties, um, those are huge components of this. Um, and having it be, um, you know, open, um, unrestricted, I think is absolutely critical. Um, but I do, I, I don't want us to back down from standing behind something if we feel that it would strengthen where negotiations start from. Uh, thanks, Anne. I, th I think that's, that's an important point. Um, so let me just go to the, to the table, which is packet page four. The first item says direct funding to counties of all sizes. And the column is, you know, HEROES Act and SMART Act. And again, the SMART Act is the one that's, that Reed, Tom Reed is pushing himself. So when we hear from on those weekly calls with Reed, I mean, that, that's something to remember. Um, and he has said so often that he wants to make sure that the money goes directly to counties, that, that the state can't sideswipe it uh, or replace it with, with cuts from the state level. But on this table, it says for the SMART Act, um, that the money would flow through the states. So versus the HEROES Act, the money goes directly to counties from the federal treasury. 
uh, farther down the page, the second to the bottom, um, about whether lost revenue funding is in, is included, and that's a, that's a big deal because all all counties, all localities are affected by the economic crash related to the to the virus. Even if you never had an overwhelmed hospital, and even if you didn't really have a lot of illness, um, so the Heroes Act would add lost revenue as an eligible funding activity um, for the Smart Act. Uh, funding to address lost revenue would be subject to certain conditions and approval by the state's governor. So that seems to go directly against what Reed has made a big point about. And then there's the final thing on packet page five is about the maintenance of effort requirements. In HEROES, it says not, uh, not applicable. So I think there's no specific direction about the about a maintenance of effort, meaning the state can hold it can't hold us harmless or can't uh, take away money in in uh, proportion to what we receive. Then the smart bill has a whole complicated paragraph about about the conditions under which the states actually can withhold money from the from local government. So I. I'm a little bit skeptical. I, I'm not convinced that this actually does what is advertised. So there's that. Um, so uh, there, I know you're shocked. Uh, so there's that. Mike Lane, and then I'll go back to Anna. It's a, it's a huge bill, but I'm not gonna hold my breath for any unrestricted aid coming to municipalities. Uh, we'd like to have it, absolutely. We think we know how best and, and most economically to spend it at the local level. But the history of these kinds of things is they're gonna tell us what we can have and how we have to spend it. Uh, so uh, I think we just need to keep advocating for the issues that we think are the most important, uh, like uh, aid to municipalities, and counties, uh, things like uh, workforce and, and, and uh, our uh, uh, child care uh, needs and things like that, and uh, highlight those over and over again. I think that's the way to attack it. But to ask for unrestricted aid, I think is barking up a wrong tree. Anna? Uh, yeah, I was curious if anybody knew about the details of the SMART Act um, restriction on um, state aid if municipalities put or states put any money into pension. Um, I would think that would hurt specifically the lowest income, you know, generating counties um, that have stopped putting any money into pension. Um, during this period because they didn't have any wiggle room. It seems like a strange restriction. I was curious if anybody knew any of those details. Well, according to this chart, the SMART Act says states would not be permitted to deposit SMART Act funding into pension funds. And yes, that was all I read. Right. And that is from Mitch McConnell. Right. That, yeah, and I'm designed. wondering what his logic. I, I, if you have heard him give any details, that's specifically what I was asking for. I under, it just seems that it would be particularly harmful for um, in situations of greater economic Hello? limitations or crisis. Um, Deborah and I, sort of, there uh, seems a couple of weeks ago, there were a couple of articles about McConnell's attitude on that. And um, it goes to... Um, a long time priority of Mitch McConnell to actually shift pension funds. I'm gonna get this wrong, it's been a while since I read the article, but to shift pension pension um, management into as I believe, the private market more. If somebody's got other kitchen stuff going on, if you could mute, mute your microphone, that'd be great. Um, so it's a, this is really not uh, kind of COVID related, but it's a long-term um, strategy uh, on McConnell's part that has to do with 
with his attitude on, on where pension funds are managed, et cetera. So I can dig that article up as well. I think in the in the end, our role is gonna be is, is not to, I, I think we should pick the things that we would like to highlight in addition to whether we sign Natalie's letter, um, but if we if we do our own communication on this, we can pick the things we would like to, to highlight. And again, in an 1800 page bill, uh, and I don't know how, how long the SMART Act is, but um, there are gonna be many, many things that we, we really can't comment on, but that, that's a good one for, for, uh, for more study. And is your hand still up or again? Anna, do you have no, something? I'm just technical difficulties. I'll put it down, but that's that's what I wanted to know. So thank you. Okay, Deborah, did you want to add something on that? Because you remember that article we. I'm sorry, I had to take a phone call, <laughs> so I that's what I. Um, so I just had like a blipped out moment. I don't even know what we're talking about at this point, and I apologize. We're talking about your cat. A haircut appointment, which is very important. Oh, okay. <laughs> Very important. You got to take that call. All right. So, so I I will send everybody the twenty three pages, and then we will have a quiz on it. Okay. Um. So, I wanted you know mostly to highlight this, and then of course we saw Natalie's letter this morning, so we can get to that later in the in the meeting further. I also just wanted to say that um, I have gotten. Um, invitations to webinars by the Council on Foreign Relations, which has a state and local government arm, which surprised me, but I think I got the, the initial invitation through NACO. And um, there's a, um, I've, I've participated in two webinars that were really interesting, one about um, medical issues with, with respect to COVID and the other on infrastructure. There's another one on Friday at 3.30, um, assessing public health risks, um, I think, around reopening. I will send that to, I guess, to all legislators and encourage folks if they have a, a chance to, to consider signing on. There are one-hour webinars where the speakers generally talk for 20 minutes and then there are questions. And there have been, on the two webinars I've participated in, there have been like 48 or 49 states represented on the call. So it's, it's pretty cool. You get to hear questions from all over the country. So I will send that around. Anna, hand up or not? I see your hand. Not hearing from Anna. I have put it down like four times and it keeps like, I am not sure, Greg, maybe you can help me. It literally says it's down on my screen. Okay. All right. That's so fine. Maybe I'll just have my hand up for the rest of this meeting. <laughs> I just, I don't know. Okay. All right, Vice Chair's report. Mike Sigler, do you have uh, anything in particular you'd like to share? There's nothing really in particular. I mean, <clears throat> from the um, from Reed's office, basically he's still having the um, you know pretty much by bi almost biweekly meetings now. Um, obviously, a lot of people were upset about uh, you know the whole phase two reopening and how that was put off and. So now the big concern over there is, you know, phase three when, you know, what's going to happen there. Um, and there's still the same frustrations we have um, are also kind of. Amanda. I, I see a lot of guys uh, federally, they're kind of weighing in on the, on the more state issues because that's what people are calling their offices about, I think, is, is, is what's going on there. Okay. Um, All right. Mike. You know, Mike. Yeah. Mike. Okay, I'm sorry. This is Amanda Spellacy calling. She's been. Oh, great. Okay. Greg, can you let her in? She says she's been trying to get on the call. I sorry. don't see anybody else uh, joining the meeting, Martha. Oh, man. There was a phone call that just dropped. Uh, I would ask her to call back in. Okay. Um, I may, you know, maybe I can hold my phone up to. <laughs> well, we can hear her. If, if you do that. All right, let's see. You just give us an update. All right. What the hell? I didn't say that. Now it's going to her voicemail. Oh, okay, boy. Amanda, if you're listening. <laughs> no, she can't. All right. All right, let me try to do this. Mike, if you wanna, I'm really sorry, Mike, if you wanna go back. 
I, I just see somebody else joining, Martha. So give me one I'm second. I'm here. I just allowed her to talk. So there she is. Martha, I'm here. Yay. I hung back up and tried to get back in because I couldn't okay. get unmuted. Thank you, Amanda. Welcome. How are you? Hi. I'm I'm here. How's everybody? We're good. The floor is open to you. Uh, just as an update, we were just talking about um, the Heroes Act versus the Cares the Smart Act. NACO had sent around a handy two-page table of really top-line comparisons. And so that's where we, we just were talking about that. And, um, but if you have an update on anything at all, we also have on the, on the agenda later, a discussion about childcare and a discussion about the federal transportation reauthorization, the highway reauthorization. So um, those are other issues we're so, interested in. I mean, I can, I'll, I'll try to make the best use of the time that I have. I've got, I don't know if Martha said, I've got 300 people sitting on my WebEx waiting for the Senator who got tied up in a, uh, I'm not gonna even call it a negotiation, a discussion. Um, so as soon as he comes back on, I have to, to go back to helping with that. Uh, so basically, I, I think probably just a quick overview on where things may be looking um, legislatively and, and what, what next steps are. I know that everybody is, you know, very poised and hopeful that we would see a COVID-4 bill. Uh, we're right there with you. Um, last week, we sent, we, the senators, sent a dear colleague letter uh, urging the expedient uh, uh, efforts to take up and begin to talk about this bill. Um, as he likes to say over and over, the uh, first responder, the teacher, the uh, family trying to put food on the table really can't afford to wait, despite what our uh, majority leader seems to think. Um, we've not really gotten anywhere with that. What I do know is this morning when I was on a call, uh, the majority leader put out the legislative uh, schedule, calendar, whatever you want to call it, for the week, and there is absolutely nothing on it for COVID. Um, negotiations have not started. There has been no efforts to, to begin a conversation. Um, about a week ago, you know, when before the HEROES Act moved out of the House or moved in the House, both Mitch McConnell had his infamous comments about letting states and, and localities go bankrupt. Um, and both he and the president were in lockstep saying that we didn't need to do a COVID-4. There began to be a bit of a backslide um, in recent, like last week, uh, where they started to say maybe soon. And we're now hearing that McConnell is backsliding and back to questioning whether or not we need a COVID-4. Um, in terms of what could happen or what might happen in, in, in negotiation if we got there, um, if you followed the scorecard in terms of the, uh, the, 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 um, the various COVID bills that we've done, hang on, give me just one second. Hi. Okay. Yeah, just get them started and I'll be there in a minute. Okay, thanks. Um, the We've sort of, I don't know if it's intentional, but there's kind of been an alternation between who picks up the pen. So um, the Senate was engaged and, and did the negotiations on the CARES Act and then the supplemental. So the pen has got went back to the House. Uh, so it's very likely that the, it, it's unclear to us at this point what role in negotiations that Senator Schumer will have. Obviously he's poised and ready to, to do what he can, where he can. Um, but just like we saw with Families First, which was COVID-2, the White House did their negotiations directly with the speaker. And it's, you know, it's likely that that kind of will, could be the way that that would go. And I only say that because um, just to give you kind of a sense of, of, of where pressure points could be or should be as things evolve. Uh, but obviously, if the majority leader doesn't want to take this up and the president won't take the leash off for him to take it up, then, um, you know, we're kind of treading water. Meanwhile, the, you know, the events that we have seen, I think, only underscore the importance of the last week of the, uh, the, the, the roles to, to make sure that local governments have the resources that they need um, to, to keep things afloat, to make sure that, you know, proper and, um, uh, you know, whatever measures that need to be de deployed to support peaceful assemblies and all of those kinds of things uh, are at their disposal. And that's just another reason why we can list them on and on how important local government funding is. And I don't think we need to do that on this call. So all of that basically says we're really nowhere. Um, I don't know that this changes the urgency you know, or not in terms of the Republicans agenda, but it is true that the um, a part of the 
HARES Act, and I'm sorry, the HEROES Act, and it is huge. I mean, it is thousands and thousands of pages. And, um, you know, frankly, as, as, a, as a top note, you know, uh, there's so many things in there that we like and love because there's robust funding for so many important areas, and we could list all of them, but I won't. Um, but one of the things that was included was structural reform to the PPP program. And that is, that is timely in the sense that those loans that have been extended need to be uh, exhausted by the end of this month. And for many small businesses, I'm sure you have all heard, those that are in various stages of these phased reopenings, many like the hospitality sector who are precluded from even fully or beginning to reopen can't even take advantage of these. So some of the structural reforms that were proposed extended the time in which a borrower had to utilize the loan from the inception, um, may change the terms if it wasn't forgiven for a longer period for payback, change the matrix or the mix in, in terms of what is for, for payroll and what's for other business expenses. Um, and so there was a separate bill that had passed the House that did similar changes that uh, is before the Senate now. And I think that not necessarily entirely, but obviously, if that as a standalone measure moves, it takes some of the urgency in the eyes of some members, not the, the one I work for, in needing to pass um, a bill to address that. Uh, I don't know what the future of that is, as we were trying to get it through and there's Republicans that are holding it up, but um, I'd keep an eye on the progress of that through the day because that may give some insight into how, um, you know, what leverage exists to try to keep driving the CARES Act uh, or the HEROES, sorry, there's so many. Um, Amanda, let me just stop. Amanda, let me just stop for a second. I, I should have introduced okay. you. Some people are new on this call. Amanda is the Amanda Spellacy is the regional uh, director for uh, Senator Chuck Schumer, uh, based in the Southern Tier. So, I'm sorry. Go ahead. No, oh, no, and uh, you know, I mean, I I'm happy to try to. I, I can take a question or two, and then I've got to get back to this. I mean, you, you know, I there's a whole bunch of stuff in that in, in the Heroes Bill. If you uh, are are ambitious and read it all, I applaud you. Um, there are some good summaries, and Martha, I can send one to you if, if you'd like that kind of, I think that's maybe like a five-page summary that gives you the top lines. But there's stuff in there for everything for robust funding for SNAP to, um, you know, extending the moratorium on foreclosures and evictions. There's like $100 billion for rent support. There's, um, you know, monies to shore up our postal system, monies to ensure that we can have a protected and safe by mail election. There is money, huge amounts of money, one point. I think it's $1.1 trillion that goes to state and local funding using the formula that we had put together and proposed for CARES. Uh, I mean, the list goes on and on. So, you know, it, it's, a, it's a really robust bill and there's a lot of, a lot of good things in there. And, you know, we're going to continue to, 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 to drive the, uh, the majority leader to, to appreciate the urgency to take this up. I just have no prognostication about what's going to happen at this point. So, uh, Deb, I'll go to you in a second, but this briefly, it, it, it's certainly clear that it's a starting point for negotiations, and that's what's, that's the idea, right? I mean, that you put, you start with what you want, and you negotiate to what you need. Yeah, I, I mean, I think that that's a fair characterization of, negoti of negotiation tactics in general. I mean, the speaker has said that this was their first, quote unquote, offer. Obviously, it's big and robust. I mean, if you look at the numbers, even in the local aid, uh, you know, we have no problem with, with, with localities seeing that, but they're almost cartoonish in terms of the volumes. And I don't I, I don't recall every single municipality, but one that just stuck out to me is the city of Binghamton had like ninety two million dollars. I mean, it's just um, but you're right the, you know, I, I, I would, as I have said to people who either get upset about something that they see in the, the heroes bill or really enthusiastic is that I wouldn't. Um, I think the buckets and the thematic points or categories are significant, but I think the dollar amounts are, you know, they are what they okay. are. There's certainly probably not going to be a reflection of reality. And briefly, is there childcare funding in, included in HEROES? Um, I will have to go back and look. I know there was, I believe, don't quote me on it, because as I said, there's so many different things. Uh, there were some mirrors of funding that was included in, I guess it was the CARES Act, 
that could be utilized for, um, you know, like block granting through the states. Um, and I also believe that there's some latitude afforded for how some of the bigger pots of money, whether it's localities were to receive or others could use those for. I can send you, Martha, I can go, I would have to go back through to pull exactly what's in there for childcare, but uh, there's almost something in there for everything we could talk about. Yeah, I believe I did see that uh, in the NACO summary. I don't remember the numbers, to be honest with you. Deborah, Deborah Dawson. Yes, thank you. Thanks, Amanda, for the update. Um, I'm curious, do, do we have the numbers to hold up the, the structural changes to the PPP that the Republicans obviously really want um, and, and use that leverage to get at least some of the stuff in the HEROES Act? Um, I'm not sure that I understand your question. Do we have the numbers? Well, I mean, it, well, I, do we have the numbers to hold up the PPP restructuring if we don't get aid to municipalities or is, or can the Senate just do that? Regarding well, I would cost, I would certainly not, like, I, 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 and I, if, if I gave a, let me, let me walk that back. I would not conflate the two of them. Uh, and I would say that the reform to the PPP, while I don't believe in prioritizing one or another, because they shouldn't be, is also in and of itself critically important. There are many small businesses, even within your own community, um, that are really dependent on these structural reforms to be able to make use of this assistance um, that otherwise they have no avenues to go to. And the biggest problem with the PPP is that it has an end date of about two and a half weeks from now. And so if you are a business, if you are a restaurant in college town who hasn't been able to open your doors, um, that assistance will make no good to you. Right. And so, um, and there's some other terms. So, uh, you know, it is critical that that, get, that gets passed. I will also tell you that many Republicans have issues with reforming the PPP, because if you look at the PPP, those that have benefited and utilized it, not across the board, but particularly in the first round were a lot of the bigger entities that tend to align themselves with um, their interests. So they've already been taken care of. The restructural reforms to the PPP are really targeted at more of the small business owner. Um, but the only reason why I just mentioned that is because that has a, um, you know, that has a timeline associated with it, which is the only bit of urgency that we, we have. But because there's a viable bill that has teased out some of those reforms, I think that the opportunity for that to even have had any leverage is already, we've already, um, that ship has sailed. And, and that bill did pass the House, you said? It did pass the House. There was only one objection. And uh, Anna, the okay. Anna Kellis? Sorry, I didn't see if my, I can't tell if my hand is working. Glad to know it is. Um, yeah. Thank you, Amanda, so much for all this information. I'm curious, when, uh, I've, I've heard from a lot of businesses who have received PPP and are afraid to use it because of the guidelines of what is, uh, of, of when it's forgivable. Um, and I wanted to know if there is any chance of any more clarification coming out on that. So the guidelines are crafted by the Treasury Department. And as you know, when, you know, when legislation is done, legislation has intent and direction, and then it looks to the agencies for the implementation. And so some of the interpretations have happened in the rulemaking process that are a little outside the sphere of congressional, uh, of, of what Congress can drive. Um, mm -hmm. the Treasury has done it, uh, I don't want to editorialize too much, has, has done a, a not great job, how's that? That's not, uh, <laughs> of, of um, putting those guidelines out time in a timely fashion. So I, I can speak from a personal perspective. I think I've mentioned this before. My husband owns a restaurant. My husband did apply for a PPP um, and was fortunate to receive one uh, and, and accepted it before any guidance was even put forth as to what he was getting himself into. Uh, so, you know, we have never used it. And in fact, we'll probably most likely be returning it because we're not an open business. Um, so many businesses found themselves in that place by extending the timeline for when it can be utilized. Um, it also gives more time for some discussions about amendments to what the repayment requirements or the forgiveness requirements would be. 
But I suspect, and this is just my interpretation at this point, that if you had a bigger window with which to utilize those funds, more time to bring those employees back, more latitude and mix. Right now, it's 75, 25, 75% 25 for your payroll and 25% for other costs. So, like, if you're a restaurant and you haven't even opened yet, that's an awful lot of ifs and chances and hurdles to jump through to maybe have like $8,000 that you can use for utilities or, or rent. You know, it's just, it's, is it worth it when you could be facing a loan that may not be forgiven at all and that you have to repay back in two years? Um, right. so if you that's have my great concern. I, I it, So what you're saying legislatively, if they extend it, they could put amendments. And I think that's important for us to know. Um, well, I, I appreciate I, that. I would just say the, the extension of the period gives more time for people to properly utilize it in the guidelines that are there. So they may be less onerous and restrictive if for nothing more than there's more time to to meet them. There also right. can be discussions about changes. So, I, I, I mean, the changes that are in this bill and uh, does nothing but I think open up more opportunities for this this assistance to be beneficial, useful and helpful to more businesses who have been left out thus far. Okay. Great. Um, Thank you. Amanda, do you have time for a, a thumbnail on the uh, federal highway bill? Uh, I have Chuck sitting here looking for me on, on my WebEx, so probably not. Um, okay. But I'm happy to come back and join at another point where we could focus more on that if you would like. Okay. Tell the senator, uh, give him our best and tell him hello. We look forward to, to seeing him back here at some point. I will and tell him, please be well. Thanks for having me and we'll talk soon. Thanks so much, Amanda. Bye. I really appreciate that. Okay, Thanks. great. Um, and I see Diane Miller and Gary Stewart have joined us. And uh, we had at least two interruptions for Mike Segler's report. Mike, did you wanna finish up um, at anything from that second interruption? I. I can't hear you. Can anybody hear Mike? It's broken up all over the place. I don't know if I am too, but um, anyway, um, no, that was pretty much the summary of my, of what I was going to say. So. Okay. All right. Thanks so much. Um, so uh, let's go to Diane. Welcome. And um, uh, I guess you did hear, seems like you did hear what Amanda had to say. And of course, I, I I did. I didn't realize that she was going to be on the agenda. I would have, uh, I would have dialed in a little bit or zoomed in a little bit earlier. Um, no, we we have a standing invitation if she can fit us in, and that's kind of okay. how it went. So, nope. I look. I completely understand. And so, since uh, <clears throat> since Amanda had a chance to go over a lot of the, uh, the 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 subtleties of the Heroes Act or some of the provisions of the Heroes Act and how it how it uh, plays out with CARES and what the Senate's going to do. There's not a whole lot that I can add to this. I know when I'm talking to folks at Cornell about heroes, I tell them exactly the same thing she told you. Don't get too attached to this because this is not the final whatever you're going to see. Um, there, is, there is a big, um, there is a big provision in heroes for higher education. Um, unlike the CARES Act, they split public and private um, in, uh, into separate tranches. And so then there's a public, a, a fund for public education that runs through the states, but it's dedicated for higher ed. And then there's a, a separate pot for private higher education that's distributed roughly the same way that the CARES Act funding came to campuses. So based largely on the percentage of Pell Grant students that you enroll vis-a-vis um, -vis your total enrollment. Um, so Cornell, after a lot, of, um, a lot of internal debate and discussion decided, unlike many of our peers, that we would accept our CARES Act funding um, to support students and their, um, the unprecedented disruptions needs that they have, financial needs that rise out of this disruption. Um, from basically closing campus and sending them home in the middle of the semester. And so we should be, the last I saw, they're this close to rolling that out. So that should be, you know, within the next little bit. Um, and so no- You mean rolling out the CARES Act money? Yeah, for the students, basically setting up the, the procedure for the students to draw those funds down 
Um, and again, it's a, the Department of Education gave some, put some guidance around it that said, you know, this, the funding can only go to students who are Title IV eligible, that is the students who file FAFSA. FAFSA. Um, so nothing for our international students, nothing for our DACA students. And so um, I know that was, a, that was an unknown when the law was passed. Um, HEROES, in the HEROES Act, the higher education provisions give universities some more flexibility. So again, similar to the discussion around the PPP, um, some more flexibility on how funds can be used and some more guidance to the Department of Education and sort of rolling, rolling those funds out. Um, what survives to the final, you know, to the final piece unknown. Um, it is certainly something that Cornell is advocating for. Um, the other, you know, obviously the, the other big piece that did not show up in HEROES was um, funding specific to the to research and so not not new research i mean there's some money in there for the nih to support covid research but sort of research operation funding so the costs helping to pay the costs of labs that have had to close down and now the additional safety procedures to put in place to open back up because we're in the process now of, at cornell of reopening labs. Um, they fit into whatever phase of the governor's um, process. And so it's a, it's, a, it's a very long drawn out procedure to do this, um, to get the authorization from the university to open your lab and there are costs involved in that. So far the Office of Management and Budget has given agencies flexibility to continue to pay people um, who are supported on grants during the time that their labs are closed. I mean, some work still goes on. You can write papers and submit new proposals and things like that where you don't have to actually be at your bench. Um, but looking at extending the time that uh, grants, so essentially giving investigators another year to, com to complete their research to take into account this pause that was uh, that was put in the middle, and so that's something that we're also very strongly advocating for at Cornell because that's a you know big part of our workforce is the research workforce, and certainly important in the community too because you know these are the the folks who are going to go out and eat at the restaurants when they open back up and that sort of thing. So um, that's another high priority, um, and I think you guys have covered up one side and down the other, the local assistance. And you know, from our perspective, the more funding that the federal government can put into state and local funds, the better, you know, whether there's targeted higher education or targeted research funds, it's better for us because we are, you know, important part, you know, we're, you know, we, we are here in the community. And if you guys are struggling, then that makes it that much more difficult for the university. So, you know, whatever, whatever we can do to advocate for whatever the most flexibility, the most direct funding to, to Tompkins County or county governments, you know, we want to be able to do that. Um, the other thing, I guess, you know, the breaking news alert is that the House Democrats this morning introduced their um, highway and transit bill. And similar to a proposal that they floated in January, it's not quite as broad. This is just, so it just focuses on highways, um, transit and rail, but there's nothing in it for the airports and nothing for other sort of building type infrastructure, um, which is one of the things that they were uh, contemplating in January. Um, but one of the, interesting pieces that they put in there is 80, and I haven't had a chance to read this bill in, in depth, so I'm looking at a summary that the Transportation Committee put up this morning, $83.1 billion in 2021, so just the next fiscal year for states and localities and transit agencies to administer programs, advance projects, preserve jobs in the aftermath of COVID-19. So it's like a one-time supplement to ensure that local localities are able to continue to offer transportation services. Um, and it says in here that there's another $22 billion available for additional eligibilities for um, salaries and operating expenses. So that would be a pot of money that would be available to TCAT. Um, 
and again, haven't haven't had a chance to look through this in depth, but there is um, they double the amount of money. Is it double? Um, oh, increased by 150 percent. So more than double the amount of funding available for bus grants. So again, you know, this is this is just the authorization piece of the bill. There was not a companion piece out of the Ways and Means Committee about how they would fund this. So no, you know, no information on whether gas tax would be or what other revenue sources they would tax to pay for this, but they've, but basically the House Democrats have laid down their marker on transportation. So, um, you know, it gives us something to work forward and I can forward that summary to you so y'all can take a look at it, um, but you know, as far as Amanda's discussion on timing and process, I have absolutely nothing that I can add to that that she didn't already say, except that we continue, you know, Cornell Federal Relations, we continue to be very engaged with all members of the New York congressional delegation to make sure that they know just how important these particular streams of funding are for sort of relief and then recovery as we look forward to sort of the next phase as things open back up. So that's that's all that I have to to report. That that is a lot, Diane. Thank you very, very much. Uh Gary, do you have anything to add? What? Is that a no? I can't hear you, Gary. You're muted, Gary. You're, you're muted. Can I unmute Gary? No. Gary, you're muted. Hey, this is good. Let's let's keep Gary muted. <laughs> I'm sorry. That's all right. I've been muted my Love whole you, life. Gary. I have not yeah, okay. I have nothing to add. Thanks. Okay. All right. Um well I see Mike Lane's hand. Did I see Anna's hand? Okay, go ahead, Mike. Well, good morning, Diane. Thanks for being with us again. Uh, I guess I'm uh, personally uh, disappointed to hear that uh, the airports didn't make it into this proposed transportation bill. I hope uh, maybe cooler heads will prevail on that one because that's Mike, pretty important. Cool. The there was a big tranche in the first COVID bill, I believe. All right. Well, I know it, but uh, we have we have projects that that do need to to happen. But what I wanted to ask you about is if by any chance you've heard anything about the possibility of congressional hearings on the census issue having to do with uh, college communities that are likely to be undercounted in the census because of the COVID uh, closures? So not specifically on the college issue, but on the census overall, I know that Congresswoman Maloney, who chairs the committee in the House that has jurisdiction over the census, is focused like a laser beam on this particular issue. And so she introduced legislation last week um, and basically she pulled the census provisions that were passed in the HEROES Act out and introduced them as a standalone bill, thinking that maybe she could get some traction on it that way, that the you know Senate might take it up as a standalone piece. And I, I don't know that that's um, in the cards at the moment, but one of the provisions in that bill, um, the, the main thrust of that bill is to extend the deadlines for um, reporting information back for the census. So again, giving more time for the um, for the count to be complete and then putting more resources again around whatever it takes to get a complete count. And there's also a provision in there that we had requested specifically um, and worked with her on drafting the language to allow colleges to provide the group count. So the group quarters count. So that's our online students. Um, without violating the federal privacy, the FERPA, the FERPA laws. And um, so that would be one of the steps that we could, the concrete steps that we can take to making sure that there's an accurate count or a more accurate count in college towns um, that would not extend to the off-campus students because we don't collect that information um, as to off-campus address addresses for the students who aren't living you know, in Cornell housing. So, um, that's, that's the hard part for us is the off campus and there's right. you know, has a lot of off campus uh, housing. Yeah. Uh, well, probably, yeah. Gary, and, Gary, 
Gary could tell you the numbers better than I can, yeah, but I know that there has been a substantial. For example, yeah. for example, in our college town, we've only got uh, just approaching 20% response rate, which is one of the lowest areas in, in the whole county. Mm -hmm. Diane, I thought that the university already could submit the group residence numbers. So you can, you can submit using the directory information. So directory, whatever is provided in your directory is not um, subject to FERPA because it's, you know, available on an out, outward facing sites, but we don't publish things that the information that the census collects on, on race, on gender, um, mm -hmm. as you know, even the address as part of um, our, our directory. So it's not a complete count. We could give them numbers, um, but that's about it. And so, you know, just in terms of having a complete count, having that waiver would be important. Other universities have more information in their um, in their directory than Cornell does. I mean, it's just a decision that we've made. And we also make it fairly easy for students to opt out of being in that directory. And so if a student has opted out of the directory, we would not be able to provide um, without this waiver, we would not be able to give any information about them to the census. Okay, Anna, I think I see your hand. Yeah. Yep. Uh, just a quick question about the transportation. Do we are there any outlines of what um, what counts for eligibility specifically? Is it ridership, um, size, population of the municipality, and is the funding going to the states to be distributed, or directly uh, will will TCAT, for example, be able to get direct access to the to the funding you? Um, so it looks like they are going to, um, but they want it. it looks like they're trying to rewrite those eligibility requirements so that it would be based more on ridership than on municipality size. At least that's the way I read the summary. Um, whether it goes through the, I can't tell again from the summary whether the assistance is direct to agencies or whether it still flows through the state in a pass through. Um, but Describe. you know, have a chance to, to take a look, a look at that. Um, I hope that'll be ridership uh, for 2019. Yeah, well, I think that everybody's in that same situation where their ridership has been decimated by the by the pandemic, and so looking, you know, it would be looking backward. But I can I can double check that. The other thing that it does say is that it will be the bus grant program will be um, narrowed in focus on bus facilities and fleet expansion. So for that. So if they're going to make a big push on facilities, I think that would be helpful for, as I understand, the, the plans for TCAT. So. Would that specifically make us eligible, for example, because um, you know, obviously you know we're looking to build a new facility. Um, is that what you're referring to, that potential? Yeah, yeah. and again, I am looking, I'm looking at a bullet point summary. I'm not looking at the legislative language. I've just, you know, and, and I, I've got, um, it was introduced about, 10 minutes before I signed on. So I've been reading it as we've been going on. So, so, so don't take anything I say on this to be definitive or, you know, the last word. And again, it, it's the opening, the opening gambit in, um, in what the house wants to do around infrastructure. And I know that that's an important priority for the speaker, again, looking at, you know, how do we, what do we do to facilitate um, recovery after we've, you know, completed our response, and, and so infrastructure is at the top of that list. And and you know, this is this is legislation they had to. The existing authority expires um, in sept at the end of September, so they need to reauthorize this legislation anyway. So this gives them a, a path to do it, um, and to do it, you know, on roughly on time. Um, and if they're able to uh, accomplish some other priorities in there, which you know, economic recovery being one of them, then that makes it, you know, that, that, that makes it even more timely. But um, last week, the House published their schedule for the rest of the summer. And so in June, they're going to be spending time doing committee work. So I imagine that you'll start seeing a lot of hearings on this proposal um, and maybe marking it up through the process so that it would be ready for consideration. And July is when they want to do all their votes on appropriations bills. 
Um, the Senate has not put out a calendar comparable to what the House did last week. Um, but uh, I think Amanda gave you sort of an idea of what their calendar is like as well. Mm -hmm. So, but I think everybody's gonna so, be busy in the next little bit. Okay, um, so we will, we are gonna segue quickly as Scott Vanderpool is, are you on the call? I am here, Martha. Excellent, wonderful. I, we can slide into that in a second. I did, I'll go to Deborah and then I have a comment on what's in our packet too. So Deborah. Thank you. Um, thanks, Diane, for that update. Um, I look forward to seeing the summary of the bill. You mentioned that it was uh, the Democrats' bill. Uh, I just wondered, is, is infrastructure and transportation a real partisan issue currently, or, or do you expect that there will be some bipartisan cooperation? Uh, I, I think there will be bipartisan cooperation. I think this first pass is, you know, this is the majority and especially because it doesn't have the funding piece in it. And that's where the partisan, where you, you tend to see the breakdown are around is um, how do we pay for it? Do we pay for it out of direct revenue? Do we pay for it out of, you know, use taxes? Um, you know, the framework that they introduced back in January had um, the passenger included a, an increase to the passenger facility charges. That's not, you know, there's, there's nothing for airports in this particular bill. It's not to say that there won't be at some point, but um, okay. yeah, so. Okay. But I think, and then, yeah, it, but in general, in general, there is support for infrastructure like this for highways and transit. It's just a question of how much money we're willing to spend. Right. Exactly. Yeah, Thank and you. also the, the formula for where it goes, and the article that we that uh, that's in your packet, um, again came from uh, from a NACO uh, posting. Um, it's a transportation allies give voice to wish list. This was March tenth. It was published, so like just pre COVID. Um, but there is one of the big points is again about the where the money comes from and the the, ga the traditional gas tax is is failing because we're having more efficient cars, electric vehicles, et cetera. Uh, Representative Sam Graves, Republican from Missouri, makes a big point about a big pitch for vehicle miles traveled for both personal and commercial, commercial vehicles. The vehicle miles traveled being a more um, sustainable and, and legitimate way to, to fund transportation, the highways on an ongoing basis. So that coming from um, the Republican on this committee and the ranking member of the House Transportation Committee, um, I, you know, I've, I think, I hope that there's um, traction on that issue. So Dan, do you have any, any idea of if that's popular? Well, I think if you get the Republicans up there saying, I know what the Democrats don't like are the public-private partnerships. They're not looking to build more toll roads. Um, they're looking for public financing of infrastructure. And so, you know, we've got, uh, um, and, and so when, when there's a proposal and that's what somebody says, here's, you know, the, I think that that's been kind of a hallmark of what the president has wanted to, to do on infrastructure is to have these type partnership type of, where there's private entities that then are collecting the tolls to pay back the bonding that they do. That, that right there is not something that the Democrats are interested in. As far as, you know, going to a vehicle miles versus, uh, you know, gallons per formula, I'm not close enough to the issue to know where that falls, you know, but if, if you've got a Republican who's saying this is what we have to do, I think that you're going to have a very receptive audience among the Democrats. Again, because it's looking at boosting the trust fund through some sort of a user fee, which, which, is, which would be priority. So uh, Graves said everything's on the table. <clears throat> uh, and he's not a fan of public-private partnerships. It's not rural counties. He's not a fan of tolling, uh, but seems to be a big fan of vehicle miles traveled, fuel tax, tire tax, and battery tax. So um, so it sounds like there's more to come. It'll be interesting to see if that sort of takes the place of another COVID bill. Um, so 
Uh, Anna, Deborah, are your hands still up or not down yet? Anna, do you have something else? No, I don't. Okay. So, Diane, thank you so very much. I think this is a, a perfect segue into the next item, which is the federal um, the, the Highway Trust Fund reauthorization. And um, if you are able to, to stick around some, you know, for a while, and I would love to hear from Scott what you think about all of this and um, you know, how, how we can help. Hi, Scott, welcome. Hey, thank you. Um, yeah, I'm, any way you can help would be great. We've got a lot going on. Uh, the future of transit is at stake. You know, it's time to rethink transit, find ways to connect people to essential jobs and retail sectors. You know, uh, there's, there's a need to be, to concentrate on essential service workers now. And it's an opportunity uh, to, connect, to actually connect with healthcare officials, uh, administrators. Um, we have to ask ourselves, you know, how can we, can uh, we help New York State's rebuilding effort to get, to get people back to work? So um, I think we have the right topics in place. It's just a matter of, and maybe it's a question for Diane, because Diane and Charlie and I kind of had this conversation already um, a, a couple months back, but, um, you know, what can we do? How can we lobby? What, 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 what is there that we can, I mean, we've got a lot at stake here, right? Um, and I, you know, I guess it's a question for Diane as well as to how, how we move forward in trying to promote ourselves. I think we have the right intentions. We've done a lot. We've done an awful lot. Um, we've worked awful hard. We've, we've, um, we, we've talked about connectivity. We've had our first mile, last mile pilot that, that went, we were just, this is not public yet and it can't go out, but um, we were awarded a $1 million grant two days ago for a DC microgrid pilot, uh, which is, has to do with renewable, renewable energy generation and, and energy storage for uh, battery electric buses, which is a uh, uh, low cost uh, fuel supply and renewable energy for our, our, our battery electric fleet that's coming up. So, you know, we've done all the right things, I think, and, and it's just a matter of how to proceed uh, with the federal government and um, trying to figure out, you know, what, what the next steps are, I think. Well, so I think that, oh. Congratulations, I, that's great. And, and you know, that's a public meeting, Scott, so you've just announced it publicly. Whoops. <laughs> <laughs> Never <Sorry>. mind. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Uh, okay. Hold, hold the presses, respect the embargo until the press release is, uh, <laughs> until the press release is sent. Um, so I think that this, the fact that the House um, Democrats have introduced their proposal means that now it is ripe to schedule meetings. And since all the meetings are in forums like this, nobody has to travel so we can work around everybody's schedule. There are um, a number of New Yorkers who sit on the transport and, and nearby New Yorkers who sit on the uh, Transportation Infrastructure Committee, including John Katko from Syracuse and Antonio Delgado from the Hudson Valley. Um, and so, and then, you know, you've got Tom Reed who sits on the Ways and Means Committee, which is where the financing comes from. So I think right now would be the time to um, work on scheduling some meetings with their staff or maybe with the members. We could probably, I'm sure we could get a face-to-face -face with Tom on this to, to walk through some of the priorities and um, either concerns or praise for this legislation and how, you know, what, what would be ideal for, um, for TCAT coming out of this coming out of this legislation and so I'm happy to sort of start doing that scheduling if uh, if if you're amenable and I don't know who uh, who would be in those meetings but we can figure we can sort that all out but sure, that'd be great. yeah I mean certainly Cornell is an underwriter for TCAT I mean we want <laughs> we want we want you to succeed because your success is ours so um, whatever we can do to help on that end. Well, that great. sounds that sounds fantastic. I was going to point out that way that Reed is being on Ways and Means, but you mentioned the appropriations hasn't come up. Is that that go the go through the appropriations committee, not Ways and Means? Which 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 committee? 
so the financing transit financing tends to go through the ways and means because of the way the okay. trust fund is um, because you still even though they haven't raised the gas tax they authorize the gas tax and so anytime there's revenue coming into the government even if it's for a direct you know stream like that that's not available to the general fund it still goes through ways and means um, good now, if there are direct appropriations to supplement the trust fund, then that goes through the appropriations committee. So that's the, again, it's one of those wonderful quirks of the way the federal government funds itself. Um, so this being, um, it, it seems like TCAT may be perfectly positioned at this point, having your site selected and I mean, maybe pulling together uh, the full proposal. So, um, I, I, I'm going to just take a, a leap here and assume that the committee would love to, to support that effort and, um, and be engaged. I know the legislature as a whole, I, I think there's no question. We would like to support that in any way we can. Um, perhaps we can have a smaller conversation, including Jason Molino and, and sort of figure out and, and somebody from the city as well and figure out what the best strategies are and, and how, how to move forward on it. So. Yeah, thank you very much, Diane. Is there uh, other things that we can do in prep for this, like a white paper or? Yeah, I mean, I think I think it would be good to have an impact sheet. Like this is what COVID did to TCAT, um, and then just maybe a, an explanation of how the funding that you received through CARES what you did with that, again, just to say that you didn't waste your money because of that, we were able to continue running buses and you know, keep the fleet maintained and wh whatever, you know, pay salaries so we didn't lose our drivers. Yeah, what, whatever the right. metrics are, again, this is, this is, there's a lot of oversight going on of those funds. And so to, you know, to have a measure of accountability and that way we too also, it gives us a chance to say thank you. Um, yep. Thank you for the lifeline, here's what we did with it. Um, mm -hmm. And so, and, but then also outlining your future plans, like what do we do post COVID? How do we keep our drivers safe? How do we keep our ridership safe? Um, if there were further operating subsidies, you know, would you continue to not collect fares? I mean, cause it looks like that's again, without having, having only read the summary and not reading the legislation, it looks like that's what they're getting at mm -hmm. is figuring out ways to support operations, mm -hmm. um, you know, going forward. Um, and so then, you know, the plans for the, for the facility, obviously, because if they're going to shift the emphasis of the bus grants to facilities, then, you know, being able to explain how, why that's good, because what we've got, on, you know, what's on the drawing board, um, and why that supports the future of transit in Tompkins County, um, I think would be key in, in drumming up support for changing those formulas. Mm -hmm. Okay, wonderful. Uh, Deborah, and then uh, we should uh, move on to, to uh, Natalie and uh, the Workforce Development Board. Yeah, thank you, Martha. I'm, the one thing that concerns me about all of this is that the CDC, when it came out with its guidance on reopening, was urging people to drive to work <laughs> rather than take transit. Um, so. Mm -hmm. I don't know that I have anything to offer with that except a question of how we're going to finesse the impact of that. Yeah, I mean, so, you know, my office is one block from a metro station in Washington, D.C. I haven't been there in two months, but, you know, everybody in Washington, if, if, if you put everyone in a car um, who currently takes the metro in Washington, D.C., nobody would ever get to work. And I think that everybody's aware of that. And so figuring out whatever the strategy is to mitigate that risk is going to be important. And so, you know, if you've got protocols on cleaning the buses and requiring people to wear masks before they get on and things like that, then you can maybe address some of those issues. But, you know, I think that that's the CDC's guidance is don't be too close to too many people for a prolonged period of time. And transit is, you know, obviously you're in this little bubble. Yeah. TCAT's been um, really good about cleaning buses and yeah, and I, th I think also if you're looking at a facility investments, then you're talking about a time scale that, you know, the, we assume, have to assume we will have a, a vaccine and, and treatments uh, by the time that facility would be open. So, so that's yeah. not, yeah. Mm -hmm. 
All right, uh, Diane, thank you so very much for, for continuing partnership. It, it is tremendous. We really appreciate it. And Scott, thank you very much yeah. for joining us. Thank you for having me, Diane. I really appreciate it again. Thank you so much. Scott, you're welcome anytime. So um, thank Same. you. You bet. Yeah, let's, let's um, maybe I'll, I'll send a note to Jason Molino uh, mentioned, and Dan Kogan mentioned that we had this initial discussion. Right. Seems to be right. And um, let's uh, figure out a plan. Okay, sounds good. Thanks. Okay. I, and I sent, I sent a copy of just the summary document from the Transportation Committee to Martha, since I don't have everybody's email, so she can forward that onto the group and then you can, you can pick through it and figure out you know, yes, no, okay. what does this mean? <laughs> okay, that sounds great. Thank you so much, Diane. Thank you, Scott. Yeah, you um, Natalie, if you want to jump on again, I know you were, you were on before. Yay, hello. Uh, Welcome, how are you? Yeah, very well, thank you. Thanks Good. to hear from everyone. You um, as well. So, uh, as you heard from Martha in the beginning, you've all received the letter uh, that was drafted on behalf of the Workforce Development Board of the county. Um, we also decided that we'd include um, signature lines for every member of the legislature and county administration, um, which really is an invitation uh, if you would like to sign the letter. Um, the advice that we've received from the National Association of Workforce Boards is that at the moment, the money supporting workforce development programs is not contentious. Uh, so in the bill that was released on May 28th, uh, there is about $2 billion, with a B, um, dollars for workforce development programs across the United States. Uh, and that is included in the HEROES Act, the omnibus bill, which as we've heard many times today, uh, includes um, everything in the kitchen sink. So, um, you know, what we'd like to do is invite you to sign if you'd like. Um, I think that what I heard from everyone in the beginning is that, you know, Ideally, you'd like to support workforce development if only that piece wasn't included in the larger bill. We've actually said that ourselves from the beginning. Um, and, you know, I appreciated being able to hear Amanda's report and um, she actually didn't mention workforce development. This, this tends to be um, non-controversial. So I think that whatever version of a bill we end up with, regardless of which party drafted the language, um, that workforce development will be preserved. Um, and so, uh, you know, really that's a question for you all. Um, just a reminder, the workforce development boards are uh, federally created. Um, we are governed by federal legislation. Uh, and the federal requirement is that we be 51% private sector led. And so with that, um, you know, we have sign off from our private sector led board. Um, and I think that, you know, the main reason that we're wanting to pull this language together and send the letter, when I say the letter, I mean to uh, Speaker Pelosi, Minority Leader McCarthy, uh, Congressman Tom Reed, and on the Senate side, Majority Leader Mitch McConnell, Minority Leader Schumer, uh, and Senator Gillibrand. So all six. Um, we feel this is an, a an apolitical message. Uh, and the real reason that we want to push this letter forward is because as of May 23rd, we have at least 8,000 initial unemployment insurance claims uh, here in the county. Um, and we are trying to understand how to move forward, um, given that some jobs may not continue in the county. Um, and we wanna make the, this process of making available skill um, and skilled individuals, um, you know, easily transitioning back into the workforce uh, and available to Tompkins County businesses. 
Okay. Um, thank you, Natalie. And I, um, since we just got it, it's several pages long. I certainly assume people will need a little time to, to look into it. Um, so is what you're saying that all the workforce development board members who are listed, they would sign, they have agreed to sign it? Yes, we're putting this language before them at the same time. Okay. Um, our, our chair and vice chair have agreed. Um, okay. And so, you know, really the option is yours. Um, I do take, uh, you know, both Mike and Deborah's points of view that if we could do this removed from the omnibus bill, of course we would. Um, but the advice to workforce boards, the 550 across the country, is to get in there now. Mm -hmm. uh, two questions. One is on page uh, three. It says that, and again, just had a chance to skim this, but Tompkins County's estimated allocation for the HEROES Act is in year one, 38.3 million, and in year two, 19.1 million. Do, did I read that right? Yes, those are figures that are from uh, a spreadsheet that has been made available on the speaker's website. So that is specific to the HEROES Act. Um, that's, for that all, that's for that, all? Yes, all that for the entirety of the HEROES Act. We don't yet have a dollar amount for workforce development specific to the county because um, those will be based on formula funding and a negotiation between the U.S. Department of Labor and the New York State Department of Labor. So really, um, what, what we're saying here is that we support things like on-the-job training, transitional jobs, um, career center support services, um, summer youth employment programs, apprenticeships, all of those things that uh, the businesses in our county do really rely on for training the workforce. Mm -hmm. Deborah, is your hand up from now or last? Oh, go ahead. Yeah, thank you. Um, I, Natalie, I think this is a great letter. Um, I, I just wonder if it wouldn't be more effective rather than to state we're writing in support of the HEROES Act, what you're really writing in support of is the level of workforce development funding proposed in the HEROES Act. Mm -hmm. and, and I would really urge you, I'll sign the letter either way, but I would really urge you to consider changing the wording of that sentence. Yep. Because otherwise, you know, somebody like Tom Reed or Mitch McConnell or Kevin McCarthy will look at the letter and say, oh, they're writing in support of the HEROES Act. We don't want to hear about the HEROES Act. I, I just want to, I, I would just propose that you add that simple language to the first sentence because it focuses the your letter on what you're really concerned about, which is workforce development. Yes, that's right. And so, um, you know, with that advice, we're happy to change the language if, if that would make things uh, more comfortable and more effective at the same time, um, because that's really uh, what we're after here is to maintain, um, you know, that piece of funding, regardless of the broader shape of the bill. I would, I would tend to think that's, that would be wise if you're willing to not, not like we're going to edit this thing, but that sort of gives, um, in a sense, gives it legitimacy. You're, you're speaking about your area, the, the WDB is speaking about its area and this is, and we recognize this is the bill that where this currently exists. It's, it's a nuance, but it might help people to read past the first paragraph. <laughs> and maybe Mike Sigler would even sign. Mike, you there? Um, yeah, no, I mean, no, yeah, I mean um, like I said, it's a big bill, and if you support, if, if you if you put your stamp of approval on the bill, you kind of are taking it as a whole. So, mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. so this is, I mean, I, I think that's a good strategy because, for example, with our next topic on the on the call, something like that would also enable us to say we really like the childcare aspect that's in this bill, or not what. It, so, 
if, if you're amenable to doing that, Natalie, that's very generous. Yeah, we're very happy to. So thanks okay. for that advice, Mike. Do you um, have... Uh, what what I, I would suggest it. then is um, if, if you can hold off from circulating the letter, letter further, okay. we'll go back and rework the language and, and send you an updated copy. Um, okay. And we can, we can also, we think we have a strategy uh, for how we can obtain electronic signatures from everyone. Um, and we'll be doing a bit of uh, photo editing here so that we can make sure everyone's represented. Um, we'll send you uh, an app to download um, and you can actually take a picture of your signature on a white piece of paper and send that through to us. And then we'll be doing some cutting and pasting. If we already have an electronic signature, can we send that to you? Yes, if you already have an electronic okay. signature, that makes things really easy. And um, so what's your deadline? I see it's dated tomorrow or today. When do you wanna get this out the door? We'd like to have the letter completed by Friday. Uh, we plan to send um, email copies and uh, paper copies okay. to individual offices. And these are the offices, um, these are the leadership offices in the Capitol, not the representative offices uh, in the House and Office, uh, House and Senate Office building. And how about the White House? Are you sending it there? No, we hadn't planned to. Advice? Well, yeah, my advice would be to put them at the top of the list. I mean, I think uh, what we're seeing is that um, the Senate leader is is really working hand in glove with what the White House wants and what the White House would sign. So I wouldn't bypass the White House. I would put them at the top of the list. Martha, would you send it to, to the president or would you send it to the intergovernmental relations guy, Crozier? You know, I think my guess, you'd send it to the president and at the bottom, I'm looking at the bottom, um, you could copy a man named William Crozier and um, copy Steve Mnuchin. He's the one who's been doing negotiations. We can, I can help you with, with what I know of those names and, but maybe your national association can, has that information too. Yeah, well, we're happy to uh, run that idea by the workforce board here. Uh, I think our intent really was to influence the house language. Um, but I'll take that away and, and we'll take that into consideration. Yeah, I think I think there's no time to, we just have to fire in all the cylinders. Yep. So, okay. okay. Uh, all right, anything else for Natalie? And then, um, cause we are a little bit past our, our uh, schedule. Any other comments or questions? Thanks a million, Natalie. Really appreciate this advocacy and, um, and there's a lot of great information in here. All right, thanks everyone. Okay, thank you. On to uh, a lot of people's favorite topic. Well, they're all favorite topic. We don't have any, any favorite children here, but um, Sue Dale Hall and Jude Rose from the Child Development Council of Tompkins and Cortland Counties, welcome. And thank you so much. And uh, you've sent us a couple of uh, documents that are in everybody's packet, uh, but I will just open it up to you both to Tell us your story and what we can do. So um, I think everybody knows that childcare is an important part of workforce recovery and the place that we are. If we want people to be able to go to work, they have to find childcare. Um, and you probably also know that we've been navigating sort of structural cracks or financial uh, uh, cliffs for a, for a long time. So we're not starting with a healthy financial system. Um, and I think that what we know from the changes that we're expecting in the next couple of months as we build our childcare system back up, um, well, just to start, we lost about 40% of um, our home-based childcare through voluntary temporary, we hope are temporary closures. And uh, three of our uh, 20 plus childcare centers, um, all of them closed, but three who were opened, reopened to serve essential personnel. So that means that the remaining group is now looking at um, 
reopening and what that means for them. And they'll be doing it in a variety of different ways and at different schedules. I think the biggest challenge that they'll face is the goal of keeping group sizes small. And if you understand how childcare is financed, that puts them in a real economic mind. Um, I do wanna say that one of our challenges advocacy-wise or legislative-wise is that 160 million was allocated out of the CARES Act for New York State. And only 30 million of that has actually been released. Um, so in my mind, time is of the essence, let's get it out and get it moving. The 30 million was very specifically for scholarships for essential personnel and the Child Development Council is administering those for Tompkins and Cortland counties and for some supplies for people, for organizations that have been serving throughout the pandemic to date, um, the work at home time, um, who were serving essential personnel. Uh, so that will all be out the door by the end of this month. Um, but that leaves 130 million at New York State. Now, when I heard that number 160 to start with, I thought that's nothing. You know, when we know that it, Tompkins County's um, child care comes to about 15 to $20 million circulating in the economy every year. So we know that um, the biggest challenge is going to be operational relief. And that's what we're looking for. Um, this is a national problem and child care is not considered a public good in the na nation's eyes. The money that does come from the, the federal level comes for child care subsidies. It's under sort of the idea of the low income workforce. It comes with a lot of restrictions. Um, there's a little bit of money for quality, but that is interpreted as um, enforcement and regulatory purposes in New York State. Uh, so what, we're, what we need to do is first shake loose the money that's available for CARES. We, when we talk to a congressman, they're saying, yeah, New York State's not letting the money out, so you don't need more. And the truth is we do need more. Um, if we want this system to not, we, we have to preserve we have to make sure that we don't have permanent closures. We need to have this, these um, programs restart. We, were, we had enough care before for one third um, of our population of children. That's not enough, we know that. We know that it was already a crisis. Um, I think the second thing to think about for us um, is the long-term picture. And there's a lot of talk about reimagining work and reimagining um, child care, child care is not a nimble system and it operates pretty rigidly because of the financial structure. So if we are to reimagine child care to match or go along with reimagined work, we're going to have to have some kind of funding to make that happen, um, just to be able to respond to that change. So in the short term, we're looking nationally at a $50 billion amount. Now I had heard that it wasn't available in, it wasn't included in the HEROES Act. I'm curious to go back and look that up myself and try to figure that out. There was another uh, standalone bill that was presented um, that's called Child Care is Essential. And that it's the same 50 billion. So what you see in the CLASP report that breaks out what New York State would get is about 2.2, 2.3, something like that billion. So um, we're talking, you know, both a sort of short-term strategy and maybe a long-term strategy as well. Yeah, that your table here, packet page 13 is two point, more than 2.2 billion to New York from that. Right. Yeah. Um, yeah, I, I, I'm sorry, you finished? Yeah. Okay, Jude, did you wanna add anything? I don't have anything to add, thank you. Okay, um, questions for uh, from the committee comments? I, uh, I just wonder if we could write the kind of letter that Natalie wrote mm -hmm. for yeah. funding, for childcare funding. I mean, that's about all we could do at this point. Mm -hmm. So the second, Second document here, um, May 18th. This is your, <clears throat> this was Cuomo's 
own task force, right, Sue, if you want to describe that, because there is this letter here already that's in your packet. So tell us about where who these folks who signed this are. Sue, I can't hear you. Did you disappear? Can you hear it me now? Yeah, yeah, good. Okay. I have... I have some kind of mystery, I think, sometimes with my sound. I'm not sure why. Um, so the letter that I included came from a task force of um, groups from a variety of different areas concerned uh, and appointed by Governor Cuomo to look at childcare and the financing structure because of the crisis that we were facing um, overall. And this was pre-pandemic crisis. Uh, they've been working for over a year and their final recommendations were due at the end of this year, um, end of December. And they came together and said, this can't wait. And so they wanted to issue together based upon the studies that they've had and, and done um, some recommendations for the short term in terms of COVID relief. Um, I will say that Jude has been part of a statewide group to look at back to business and what it would look like for childcare and trying to project what the deficit could look like. And um, that isn't included in the letter, but I think it's strong enough information that we could, um, Deb, if we wrote a letter um, from Tompkins County, add that information in. Because it basically looks at a, a $3,000 a week, I believe, Jude. Um, deficit for each of these programs. That would be how uh, much 30. they're they losing if they operate at lower um, capacity levels to prevent the spread of COVID. Um, our directors heard that number and Tompkins County rates, it looks more like it would be 20 to $27,000 a month. So we're talking a pretty significant deficit and they have been writing me and saying, and calling me and saying, look, we're gonna be out of business by the middle of summer. We won't be able to sustain this. So that's, time is really as of the essence. I would uh, just add to that, that the home-based providers, um, in contrast, have some different supports that are coming in with their unemployment benefits or getting, many of them have applied for PPP loans. And that the deficit that we calculated for home-based providers was 3,500 to 4,000 a month for a group family. So ironically, this the group family is one who suffers more because their group is larger than that um, size of 10, right? Okay. Um, right? And so that's, you know, that's quite a chunk of money for those folks as well. And when other kinds of supports start to disappear, they're confidence and their like continued receipt of payments from parents that's been going on is not going to um, be there for, for their own financial support. So that kind of money, just to let you know, this, the research that we did was based on market rate. And, um, and so that's probably a low ball in reality. And as you see with the different number for the centers, it's quite potentially a low ball, but it is a significant amount of support that could be helpful. Okay, I see Anna's hand, but just what, first, I, if we perhaps if we could, um, if we could get a letter together about the state money, about the CARES Act money, and the federal, you know, uh, the federal yep. movement is important too. But it seems like the low hanging fruit is is the state money, and of course we have more direct connections to uh, to Albany that we can, you know, kick around. So. Um, but I'd, li I'd like to prioritize that if it makes sense to you. Um, yeah, Jude. Um, Martha, I believe that the um, our state child care resource and referral, the um, Early Care and Learning Council, I believe they're trying to get this information regarding the financing piece has already gone to the governor, um, governor's task force about two weeks ago, one and a half maybe. Um, and they're in regular contact regarding that. I think they've been doing some revisions and helping to get the final by the end of this week. Is that about the 130 that's not been spent yet? The objective was to try and give some information, yes, for the 130 um, of what would be helpful for childcare. Okay. Is it possible to get a copy of that when it's finished? 
Absolutely. Yeah, but it, it helps to to send that to uh, the legislative leadership, to send it to our own leader, our own lawmakers, to send it to what we know on the second floor. <clears throat> so we, we would like to amplify that message. And I see your hand, but then it disappeared. Yeah, I put something in the chat. I'm not sure how well my audio is coming through, but I, I was curious if you could just outline, have they given any sense of what the holdup is of releasing the money that's already been allocated to childcare? And is there anything that we can do to help the release of that funding? That's kind of what we're talking about. And, yeah. and no, I understand the letter specifically, um, but beyond that, do we have a, a clear sense of exactly why it hasn't been released? We don't have a clear sense, no. We have suspicions, but we don't have a clear sense. I mean, the only just, reason why I ask is because it would make it easier for us to direct a letter if we understood uh, what the barriers for release are, that's all. Anna, I would uh, remind you of what something that Jason Molino said last night at the ledge meeting, was that the, the state is out of money, is that they're having cash flow problems, which is why I asked him about our cash flow problems. And simply, hi, Jason, do you want to weigh in on this? Is this, you know, the idea? <laughs> Just going to let me quote you and say whatever I want it to say. cash flow issues. So we've been experiencing this from several different areas. Workforce development funding was toyed with, and that's actually federal pass-through money. That created a little hysteria two weeks ago. That's been worked out. There was an issue, and there is an issue now with some payments for DSS and OTDA. So we're starting to see the little levers being pushed in terms of delayed and state payments and and then kind of little games playing here and there and, and then they pay once we once we pipe up so i would expect that this is going to continue because the state has is having a cash flow constraint issue it's not appropriate but you know it, it is what it is they're delaying yeah. payments. You know, it's not different than paying your bills a little bit later that sounds like we should pipe up yeah i think it's time to pipe up and this is and he's gotten some political um, push back on that on the Tom Reed calls uh, during a couple of weeks ago. There was a lot of uh, a lot of comment on this and like kind of where the hell's the money and you know. Um, so I, I would like to you know if we can kind of make noise about this. Um, I think Martha, I just want to finish my my comment and then I'll mute myself. But part of what I've been experiencing anyway in the work that I've been doing during the campaign is that. Um, the austerity measures will cripple us economically long-term, maybe of having that clearly communicated of what the long-term economic impact would be to the county. Um, I think that would be a good message to communicate. I mean, we, we had a crisis in terms of the lack of providers before this ever started. The idea that we, we could lose a half to two thirds of them is, is chilling, you know? Right, and how much time it would take right. to rebuild that workforce right. versus preventing the and loss I'm of I'm sorry, even if we reimagine work and a lot of people are working from home, if their children are in the same room or the next room, that they're not really working. So that doesn't change the need for childcare for the good of the kids as well as the worker. So, all right, well, so let's follow up on that and try to get something out the door that can support that effort. And, uh, and we'll keep looking for information in the HEROES Act and the SMART Act as well, on, specifically on childcare. Great, thank you. Thank you. All right, um, I hate to, to sh cut that conversation off, but there's a lot to go. Jason, did you have any, any uh, updates or any other comments you wanted to throw in? Uh, raise for us. Uh, but if there's this an issue statewide, we should, uh, and we're going to push the state or the governor on it, we should probably see if NYSEC has any initiatives on it. Okay, you bet. You know, they, they've been, they've been, they were helpful with uh, the uh, workforce development stuff. So if that, that's probably someone to check in with to see if their other counties are experiencing the same thing. And if so, there's a way of getting a collective effort. That's another thing I would add. Okay, absolutely. It sounds good. We got a lot of homework to do. But that's that's why we're here. Thank you, Jason. Um, <clears throat> a TCOG, Tompkins County Council of Governments. We are wow, we're really late <laughs> in the meeting. Uh, that is Sean is our representative there. She said, Deborah, you were you've joined the Energy Committee of TCOG. No. Yes, um, she asked me to 
tune in. Um, they've expanded that committee somewhat uh, to include folks from the case board um, because I think their initial focus is going to be uh, on CCA and um, the knowledgeable people are, you know, the people on the case board. <laughs> So uh, yeah, we had an initial meeting about CCA. I, I mean, from the county perspective, I, I'm not sure there's a huge role for us unless we get enough municipalities together to, to really consider the economies of scale of having the county be the administrator for these various programs and of course be compensated for that service it would just keep more money local okay that's i mean we're nowhere near having any real specific proposals okay jason did you want to add anything i think tcog has been meeting every other month is that right okay all right, well, we'll just keep uh, TCOG on the list on the agenda here for, for periodic reports. Thanks very much, Deborah. Um, so now we have like 15 minutes to decide our goals for the year. So, um, and I'm gonna ask that we d defer the minutes until uh, next time, we can, we can take those up next time. Um, the, uh, but if you go to packet page 22, um, I mean, I'll just open the discussion here uh, you know, I, I brainstormed with myself, which is not always the most fertile, you know, place to brainstorm, but, you know, I, you know, it's sort of obvious we're going to track state issues. That's number one, number, not in any priority order, but we're going to track federal, federal issues with, uh, with NACO. Um, the point here about action steps and uh, TCOG and then other committee issues, which Deborah had actually raised to say, um, you know, are we when a, when another committee raises an issue that might need lobbying or advocacy, are we going to take those on as well? So that's a, a lightning speed summary of what's here. Um, but I put in red number five at the top of the page. What actions will legislators take? If you if you look at one, two, three, four, it's a lot about how we work with staff. And this committee is is a different animal and this is, um, you know, staff help, staff and agency as we've seen and, and our community partners I think can help in, inform the issues and, and tell us what's important and, and what the role is. I'm leery about tasking staff who don't, I mean, Natalie and her, and her department initiated, initiated you know, a, lo a lobbying and advocacy action, and we can fill in, we can support that. Um, but in general, I think our role is a little, it's, it's not the same as other committees. So um, I don't wanna take a lot of time from my point of view, but I, I would love it if you all could react um, about these thoughts and how do we define our role and how do we um, put goals on paper? So I see, Deborah, Anna, and then Mike, I'll take a, and Mike, I'm delighted that you're here. So even though you're not on, folks may not know Mike's not on the committee. It's great that you've been part of this. Um, let me start with Deborah and Anna. Oh, excuse me, I'm not part of this committee? You're not a member of the committee. I thought I was. Committee members are myself, Mike is, Mike Sigler is vice chair, Anna, Deborah, and Shauna appointed to the committee. I'm sorry, but when we asked for volunteers, originally I was one of the ones that volunteered for the committee, so I thought I'd been appointed. Uh, so this is news to me, uh, but thank you for telling me that. I'm sorry, Mike. I'll um, chat with Leslin about it. So, the more okay. the merrier. You know, I, I'm happy to have everybody, you know, totally. Like, let, let well, because I know Henry was interested and Corman too. So let's. Um, I don't, I don't care <laughs> about committee status at this point. So let's go to, to Deborah and then Mike and Anna. And Jason, I see Jason, I'm gonna have to get off in about five minutes. Looks like he may already been gone. So, okay, that was in the chat. All right, Deborah. The only thing I wanted to, to point out was that tracking state federal 
and TCOG issues and committee issues. I mean, it all, it's all kind of part of getting information so that we know what sorts of things we need to be lobbying on. I mean, I think that's the whole purpose. Mm -hmm. You want to divide them up into, you know, to me, it's like you find out what needs to be addressed and then you go to action items, which is how you address it. But if you want to divide it up into five things, that's cool. We can write these goals however anybody yeah. would like. So, um, and I think what was sent in your email is a Word document. So I invite you to to make comments and send them around to the rest of us. Um, Mike Lane. Um, I, I agree with what you, your point about this committee being a, a different animal. Uh, exactly, and and it's hard to say. Well, you know, how do we? What what's our goal, and how how do we, at the end of the year, say we accomplished or didn't accomplish the goal? Uh, I see it as as this conduit, but the, one of the things I think we should be trying to figure out is how we communicate what we learn. And this has been very useful listening to these people from Albany and uh, and and Washington, and and, and uh, how do we communicate that back? To the other legislators now we can say well we do the minutes but it's not the same thing i'm thinking that we ought to think about some kind of a bullet sheet after each meeting uh even some a little bit like uh like jason does when he does his uh reports back to us you know it could be a, a, a line or two about two or three issues it could be in the red folders for example or or sent out electronically uh, but I think if it was in the red folders, people would actually look at it. So that's my thought here. How do we communicate? We, we receive the information. How do we communicate it back to our group? Mm -hmm. Okay. And, and the minutes are like the minutes in your packet here are very comprehensive. And that's why I really want to make sure that we've got everything right in there. So that's one issue, but you're right. People, we're all getting 10 page documents that we don't have to you know, time to read. Um, Anna? Uh, I think, you know, another thing that's really important is um, to coordinate with the other committees um, that uh, one, you know, wh whoever is being brought in, um, you know, if they, if they traditionally report to another committee that um, that chairs are communicated with and invited to attend because it will obviously affect their committee. Um, I think we should just be careful, thoughtful about coordinating. Um, so that's just one thing as far as logistics. Um, and, you know, one of the things on a national level, if we're just talking about, you know, things that are affecting us that I'm particularly very worried about, but doesn't get talked about very often, because it just seems a bit powerless, we're a bit powerless right now is the environmental, um, you know, sort of deconstruction of environmental protections that are happening. And um, when we talked about the uh, transportation and infrastructure bill earlier, um, at the state level, we're at least having conversations that those um, priorities of infrastructure be uh, green infrastructure development. I don't expect that um, to be an easy lift on the federal level by any means, um, but that doesn't mean we shouldn't make a stink about it. Um, and I, I really think that people do need to speak up because those are happening with very little pushback at this point, there's sort of a sense of hopelessness. So I would just add that one, um, that one priority for me and everything else I'll, I'll look through and put by email. Okay. Mike Sigler, do uh, you have anything, any thoughts on this? Sorry, no, uh, no, I think we're, we're good. I think this is a pretty good meeting. We, we accomplished a lot and heard from a lot of people. So we're good. All right. Well, um, I would really, really invite folks to, to help sort out how we how we write up goals and how we how we determine a way to move forward. This format may not make sense. Even I mean, this is the this is the template from other committees. Um, we don't have to be stuck. We don't have to use this this particular format. Um, it's something like a 
a summary after each meeting. Um, who would do that? I mean, I, I've, I've written down with big stars, you know, six or eight things that I want to do to follow up this meeting. So, and that's not even writing a summary. So that's kind of the issue is we want to be, I would say thoughtful and reason, you know, uh, realistic about what we actually can accomplish and what people will, you know, and it, it would involve some people taking on, hey, I will do that. You know, yeah, we need an op-ed. Deborah did an op-ed about uh, the bankruptcy issue when McConnell came out, you know. Uh, will somebody sort of draft a, some tweets or a post for Dominic to put out, that sort of thing. So if, um, if we can share that load, um, that I would think uh, we'd be able to get a lot more done, but it's different, um, as we said, different than other committees, so. Well, one of the problems with, with delegating who's gonna write the summary is that yeah. m m what's important to me as a takeaway from this meeting may be somewhat different from what's important to you, Martha. Yeah. and share. So I don't know quite how we get around that. One possibility is rather than sending something to all of the legislators, um, you know, if, if among the people that come to these TIGER meetings, we have members of all the other committees, you know, you could carry back what's relevant to your other committees to that committee. Um, and that it that would maybe kill two birds with one stone because it would it would accomplish informing your legislative colleagues as well as coordinating with the other committees. Mm -hmm. That's certainly true. Um, timing in it is an issue too. Some of this stuff you really have to be. I mean, Tom Reed has been saying that there will be a federal bill by mid June. Okay, the legislature next time the ledge meets is mid June. Um, you know, we, we kind of have to if we're doing something on on this federal bill, we we have to do something right away. Um, I mean, I think the idea of, of continuing to keep these issues in the conversation for all of us is really important. Um, I mean, I can certainly make uh, and make an effort to put out a summary. Um, I'll definitely go back to Leslie and say, what do you, you know, what's the structure of this committee and the membership of this committee? That that might make a difference too. If, you know, if seven or eight people are actually committee members, I guess we can't have eight, that would be the legislature. But if up to, if up to seven people are committee members, then, then there's sort of less, then everybody's engaged right here. So, um, hey, Martha. Right. Yeah, Mike. No, I just I, so here in the discussion too. When when you first started this committee, and when this was first starting being talked about, the idea that we can accomplish maybe three big things a year, that always that makes sense to me. Like I remember cause last year, you know, we we wanted a third court judge, we wanted to block that incinerator upstate. There were certain really concrete things. I think that would actually be valuable if each committee member said, you know, what are my big three or what are my big five? Like for me, if, if, if the schools, the public schools, I don't really like what the governor's talking about with distance learning and that really being a much bigger component in public schools. And not that I'm against that. I don't know what that means. And that's concerning to me. So or if Cornell isn't really giving a lot of guidance on whether they're going to reopen or not in the fall. I mean, that, I, that's a concern as well. I, I, I'm not really sure what, what we kind of do with that. And I don't know if that's really a lobbying effort as much as, but maybe it is. What, what does Cornell need to reopen in the fall? I, what, what can we do to help them? You know, kind of idea. So, I guess if I were to make up a list of my big five, those two are, are pretty high up on it, so. Yeah, I wanna be careful not to duplicate work that other people are doing. Um, at the last meeting, we heard in some depth from Charlie Krasansky about um, 
Cornell's efforts, and that was really interesting. Um, but we know that Jason and the various other, you know, staff people are working with them and working with CMC. Um, but I like the idea of like if every committee member would say, okay, of all the things I've heard of, I'd really like it if we could have an impact on these three issues. And you know, it could it could be something like this one's going to get done by by September, and then we'd move on to something else. But uh, maybe that's a way to structure this to see as a committee if we have issues that we would prioritize out of this whole mess of things we could spend all our time on. Um, uh, you know, that maybe that's a way to to structure the the conversation, Deborah. I'm sorry, for some reason, it's just my mute button doesn't want to unclick. <laughs> I guess the universe is telling me to shut up. Um, anyway, um, I, the, uh, the only thing we need to remember is that we may have priorities of things that we would like to push for and accomplish. Um, but at, at the end of the year, if we're not successful, that doesn't mean we failed, you know? Right. So you have to be careful about how you... Um, how you articulate your goals. You know, right. you go, no, I'm going to work on this. I'm not necessarily going to succeed. Right. Yeah, yeah. We are not responsible for what level of state and local funding gets passed. Right. Mike Lane. I, I had a question. Uh, maybe it's not necessarily a goal question, but uh, before we, before we leave, uh, I really liked hearing from Amanda Spellacy at these meetings. Do we have a connection with someone similar in Gillibrand's office that we could ask, ask to come from time to time? Um, yes, I, I just learned that, and well, Sarah Clark is the person we've had the most contact with. Turns out I just learned she's running for assembly. So she's probably busy. Um, I will also tell you that um, since Senator Schumer is the minority leader. That's really where the juice is. You know, um, I, what do you, what, you're shaking your head? I'm just saying you have two senators and, and we need to have both of them working for us. Okay. I will, um, sure, I can absolutely reach out to Sarah. And if she's not, um, if she's too busy, there might be another regional rep who can uh, engage with us. That's your good point. Very good point. Yeah, we need to cultivate more relationships because if something, if if Amanda leaves, then what have we got? You know. Yeah, I've had had contact with some of the other uh, regional reps too, but um, yeah, I mean, whoever whoever is Schumer's rep in the Southern Tier, for whatever region we are, uh, would have the responsibility. It would take um, some time, I guess, to, to develop the familiarity we have with Amanda, but. Yeah, but you've worked on that for a long time. You know, there's a personal link there, and she's getting to know all of us on the committee. I, I think that counts for something more than just the responsibility of being a regional rep. Okay. Okay. Anything else from anybody? All right. Well, I'll work on my, my to-do list here, and homework for everybody here is, is identify the three issues you – you think the committee should work on as a priority and maybe one that you would be willing to take initiative for how about that if we can one of those either one of those one of those three i assume um i think that would help if we have okay so and so is going to be the champion of the child care initiative and so and so is going to bird dog transportation um that might that might make things more effective Does that seem reasonable I see one nod. Everybody else, I'm going to assume silence is assent. So, all right. Anything else for the good of the order? Thank you, everybody. Uh, Katrina, thanks for <laughs> thanks for writing furiously. I'm sure, and um, appreciate everybody's time today. So, I will consider us adjourned. Have a great afternoon. Thank you.